four. Okay. But they can unmute themselves, so that's fine. Good. That's... They can hang out and listen to me though. So. Can they hear us now? Oh yeah. I wonder what they came from. All right. So I don't think we started the eighth chapter, did we? Eighteenth chapter. Did no, we? no, okay. we were twenty-seventh of chapter seventeen. Didn't we finish it? We finished the chapter. We finished the chapter. We did? Yep. Yeah. We did the exegesis yes, of Om Tatsa. Yeah. That's the tail end of this. Yeah. All right. Chapter 18. Okay. Summation of the teaching. Arjuna Vaja. Samya Sasya Mahabahu Tatvamichami Veditum Tyagasya Chakrishi Kesha Pritakeshini Shudana Arjun said, I desire to know severally, O mighty armed, the essence or truth of renunciation, O Rishi Kesha, as also of abandonment, O slayer of Keshi, Krishna. So we have these two terms which are very similar, sannyasa and tyaga. Both are frequently translated as renunciation. But a subtler understanding of tyagaha is abandonment. What's the difference? Sannyas is when I make the deliberate choice to let go of something. I'm going to renounce something. Abandonment. I always think of children. So you've got a kid who's playing with a bunch of toys. If any of you have nieces and nephews or kids, you know, when they're done with their toys and something else distracts their attention, what happens to the toys? Okay. They don't leave them where they are. I'm talking about like two year olds, three year olds. In other words, they don't, they forget about it. it's gone. Or the other great example I like to use is when you were a kid, if you had a, a tricycle and you were around the driveway in your tricycle, and as you got a little older, you got a two wheeled bike. What happened to your love and attachment for the tricycle once you got the two wheel bike? Um, we leave it behind. We abandon. So they're similar, but slightly different flavor. Let me see if I can give a good example of sannyasa. So again, I go back always to my familiarity with people who are in recovery, who have difficulty with drugs and alcohol. Finally, they get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they learn one is not enough and a thousand, no, one is too many and a thousand is not enough. So they make the choice, I have to give this up. And the mind may go, no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna. If you had my problems, you'd drink too. It's a standard thing. No, you can keep it up. And you get the waggy finger from your doc, your liver's about ready to burst. If you don't quit drinking, you're gonna die. Give it up. That's sannyas. So there's a little bit difference in flavor between these two terms. Any thoughts about this before we go on? 
how does the abandonment apply in the adult context? Um, when was the last time you went out and got drunk at a dance club on Friday night? It's been years. What happened? I don't achieve any memory. It's been a very long time, Jim. But why did you not? What, what happened to it? Did you do it at one point here? Yeah, you were young in my old? 20s. Yeah, what happened? I guess I just moved on. Yes. Jaga. Okay, so that's abandonment? Yeah. Okay. You didn't say, I'm not going to the club. It's just you have found other things. So yeah. just kind of moving on. Something. That's part of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now we're going to look at these two ideas in a spiritual context. All right, going on. Next verse. Um, Shri Bhagwan Vacha Kama Yanam Karmaram Nyasam Samyasam Kava Yovidu Sarva Karma Falatyagam Prahustyagam Vichakshana. The Blessed Lord said, The sages understand Samyasa to be the renunciation of works with desire. The wise, declare, the wise declare the abandonment of the fruit of all actions as tyaga. Yes. So now in a spiritual context, let's break them down. So first, mm -hmm. sannyas. And read the definition again. Sorry, say that again. First definition of sannyas. The sages understand sannyas to be the renunciation of works with desire. So, when I finally have given up ego-prompted activity. Now, this is a subtle idea. First of all, all action for human beings has as its impetus desire. Well, let's say we're supposed to give up all you, uh, uh, all actions prompted by desires. That mean I should just run around do everything I hate? No. no. But you know when your mind is presenting to you the idea this is what I need to make me happy. Make happy when it will be better if I'm in the wrong place, I've got the wrong home, I've got the wrong job, I've got the wrong partner, or I need to get a partner, I need to get rid of a partner. That somehow I'll be happy when it'll be better if my restlessness, my discontent is because the world needs to change, or I need to change. If only I were 20 pounds thinner, you know, if only I were six inches taller, you know, if only I had a higher degree of education. There's nothing wrong with having goals. But if you labor under the illusion that getting what you want is what's going to make you happy, Just look to your direct experience. None of us are kids. How's that working out for you? Fool thinks, well, obviously I just haven't gotten what I wanted yet. So my desires keep shifting. It's the wrong person, the wrong job, the wrong house. So here, it's not about wearing a loin cloth and running around with a begging bowl. Some people are drawn to that life. But that's not the sannyas, the renunciation that Krishna is talking about. It's to give up the idea that what's wrong with me is wrong my life is people 
replaces things and conditions. Preferences is not an issue. What's the between a preference and an insistence? If it's a preference and you don't get what you want, it's not a big deal. It's an insistence and you don't get what you want. And you're pretty angry about it, or very sad about it. Any thoughts on this? So, oh, so go ahead. So none of the things that we think are the source of our happiness are the source of our happiness. It's just happiness, a choice that I could be like, okay, I'm just gonna be happy now. I'm gonna be happiness happy. is the mind freed from the tyranny of craving. It's the mind freed from the tyranny of attachment. Let's go through this paradigm. Here's my little stone. There it is. So let me reintroduce you to this idea of Dharma. Dharma is the nature of a thing, without which it would not be the thing that it is, or the essence of a thing. So it's the dharma of water to be wet. Who here experiences wetness in water? Everybody. It's the dharma of fire to burn. Who here experiences burning fire? It's the dharma of sugar to be sweet. Experience of sweetness and sugar, everybody. But what is it that has happiness as its dharma? If we were to poll the room, we would say, well, it kind of seems to vary from person to person. Some of us want a little love, some of us want a partner, some of us want to own property, some of us don't want to do that. Some of us want lots of jewelry. Higher education, but it does Some of us like boys, some of us like girls. Parents. So we cannot find any one thing in the world that has happiness as its dharma. But who here gets a little moment of happiness when you get what you want? Everybody has that. So what happens? I decide in my mind, literally just based on the force of my past, it's far more habit than anything else, what it is that's dear to me. So we use the prayer stone as the widget. What I think it is that's going to really do it for me. Technical term for that is Priya, if it's dear to me. So what do I do once I decide that the widget is dear to me? I don't have any widgets. Well, I gotta buy it, I gotta make it, I gotta earn it, I have to marry it. I do whatever it is to get proximate to my object of desire. Everybody understand that? Want a Mercedes Benz? You gotta go buy one. Want status? If you don't have status, you gotta marry it. So this is called molda. When I proximate to my object of desire, then the desire and object of desire finally unite, meaning I get what I want. From the point of pleasure in my ignorance. There's another technical name for this. It's called the Ananda Maya Pusha. Those of us who study Viveka Chudamani have a long discussion about that. Now, in ignorance, I attribute the joy, the happiness, the pleasure, the satisfaction to the object. So after that pramoda, mm -hmm. I know 
oh man, widgets are where it's at. I want some more widgets. But it's Sunday, the widget store is closed. Oh, man, I can't afford a widget anymore. It was so expensive before. Oh, there's only five widgets in the world, and other people have all the widgets. The widgets don't like me. There are all sorts of ways in which I feel separate from my hands. Now, what actually is happening when I desire the widget, that desire is called Pama. Usually translated as desire. I like to translate it as craving. It's a little stronger than just, oh, I like such and such. Scripture will use words like spreha, which means longing. Vancha. I want it. The Buddhists like to use the word Krishna, which is thirsting. That's what actually hurts. So you tell me, can you find any other suffering? Now, we'll take physical pain and put it on the shelf, but that's really not what afflicts most of us. Can you find any other suffering other than wanting something you don't have? Or the flip side, aversion, I want to get rid of the stuff I don't like or I call it the neurotic form. I have what I want, but I'm afraid of losing it. Then I'm like a person at a banquet with a thorn in my throat. Can't enjoy it because I'm full of fear. Of course, the classic example for young people, you're on a date with somebody that you connected with online, it's the first date, you seem like a really nice person and you're terrified you're walking on eggshells and you're totally anxious. Who's ever had that experience? Can't enjoy it. Can't enjoy it. Because you're afraid. And don't believe me. Don't believe the scripture. Somebody find me another kind of suffering. I have a question. Yes. I have a friend who. Uh, spent her whole life working toward medical school, is now a doctor, is having a baby, it has a wonderful husband, has a great life. And I think that she thought the whole time that if she got there, everything would be great. And now she's woken up with this great life and she realizes it's still not enough or that it's not, that it's not that great, I guess. What, which of the three categories does that fit into? Well, the that's a little subtler form. Yeah. But what she's experiencing is as long as we labor under the belief that the widgets are what's going to do it, we can labor under that delusion as long as we don't have the widget. Once you get the widget, you see, eh, it's a widget. Oh, I really, really want a Porsche. It's great when you drive it off the, the showroom floor, but six months later, it's just a car. Make it sense? Yes. Now, there was a great operatic tenor by the name of Luciano Pavarotti. Anybody heard of him? Mm -hmm. So his great desire was to be the world's greatest tenor. And then he got it. And he had the same experience as your doctor friend. It didn't do what he thought it would. And he went into a very deep depression. Then he was flying into the Milan airport in winter. And there was ice on the runway. And as the plane was landing, it hit an icy patch and it skidded off the runway, crashed and split in two. And he almost, you know, it was a life threatening situation. He's actually helping people down the slide and stuff like that. All of a sudden, his attitude changed. And he began to see how precious 
the gift of life for us. But what he did changed. He continued to sing, not so much to be the famous tenor, but because of the love of the music and to really give this gift to people. And then he started all sorts of forms of service. You know, uh, competitions, training things. Any of you remember the three tenors? Yes, no? Yes. You know how that started? One of his colleagues, Jose Carraris, had leukemia. And he was, he was uh, in remission, but he never got his strength back. He could not sing an entire operatic role. So Pavarotti went to Domingo, Papudo Domingo, and says, look, let's do this three tenors thing. And then Jose doesn't have to sing a full role. He didn't even have to sing a full aria. We'll cover the loud stuff, you know. But Carrara's still in a beautiful voice. Just not a lot of strength. And it was it was service. It was save up to help Jose Carrara. You just think of all these stories about what shifted in his life. Because it was no longer about give me what I want. Is that useful? It's one of my favorite stories. So that kind of suffering is a subtleized form. And I thought that this was gonna make me happy and then it turned out not to. It was beginning to see the emptiness. Now, if we get what we want and we get a momentary hit of joy of happiness, what we're actually experiencing is for a moment the mind is freed from its longing for just a moment that's happiness it's not in the object it's your self nature So the question that arises, is it possible to have an experience of the bliss of the self independent of the objects of the world? Lord of Thunders, yes. This we learn to do with two major practices. Viveka, Discrimination, by anagya, by anagya, by anagya. Let go of my attachments, let go of my attachments, let go of my attachments. Let me see if I can give you a very worldly example. Who here has been driving on the freeway and you're cutting it close time wise to get to a meeting or a date or something like that? You know you're going to be late and the traffic backs up and you're like, mm. Who's had that experience? <laughs> you know, and you try to push the traffic with your heart. <laughs> you know that feeling? And then finally you go, oh, I'm going to get there when I get there. You done that? Yeah. You let it go? How do you feel once you let it go? Much better. Yeah! Why? Rather than getting what you want, you drop the attachment. Do you see that? So this is what the first part of this verse is talking about. The yogi, the wise person, moves through life. It's the phrase that Priya made up that I just love. Radical, perpetual acceptance. Radical, perpetual renunciation. The same thing. Accept life on life's terms. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all 
calls also. So we were talking about Christianity. These are things Jesus said about it. My kingdom is not of this world. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. That's not what he called it. No, that's what we have right here. I bring you a peace, a peace that passes all understanding. I was looking at a documentary today about Ramana Maharshi. The first few decades of his work. He was in silence. The devotees would come and he would just not move. Put them in Samadhi. No external object is the cause, it's the absence of the agitated mind. It's a great question and it's fundamental to understanding what we're doing with this. Any other questions on? Sorry, the last follow up. And does this apply also for the neurotic type? Because that's the one that is the most irrational one. <laughs> it's like you have it, but you're like, ah. Yeah, the mind is still agitated. It's still agitated. It's the agitated mind that's the problem. Oh my God, I'm going to lose it. Oh my God, I'm going to lose it. You're not present to the experience. It reminds me of young people who are out on the dance floor and kind of finding somebody they're interested in and they're dancing together. And then all of a sudden, you notice that the person you're dancing with. Looking over your shoulder to see if there's somebody hotter in the dance floor. Remember those days? You would never do anything like that. You can't be present. Something that. Is service part of the answer or is it a consequence? Service is, is a practice that helps. The most painful position in the mind is what I call paranoid self-observation. How am I doing? Am I okay? What do they think of me? That is probably the most painful state of the mind. And one of the things service does other centers are attended faculty. We have genuine concern for another person. It's a very, very effective tool. And we actually have it as a practice in yoga. It's called seva. Now they call Swamiji, let's see, what do they call him? Puja Guru Dev, is that what they call him now? Yeah. He was just Swamiji once. Someone would ask him, Swamiji, what's your title? He said, Mukya Seva. What's that mean? We have that within Christianity. There are all sorts of people I know, at least in the military, because my brother got introduced to it there, called servant leaders. 
Have any of you in management heard of that concept? All right, enough on this, but to really internalize this understanding of, uh, I call it the pleasure principle, but I think the psychologists use that term too. I've got to find another name for it. But this understanding of how pleasure works, what happens to the mind is foundation. Otherwise, sannyasa doesn't make any sense. Some people then do a view. I want people to see how holy I am. Smear their face. Oh, I'm fasting. All right, let's now move on to Tiagaha, the second part of that verse. The wise declare the abandonment of the fruits of all actions as Tiagaha. Yes. So here is how we're invited to practice Tiaga. Thy right is to work alone, never to the fruits or the outcome. I was having a conversation with a dear friend this week, and um, he's a very, very talented actor and singer. He did professional theater in New York. Uh, now he's in academics. He's actually, uh, he's chairman of the department of the local university, the theater department. And artistic director of some local theaters and stuff like that. And finally, after many years, he saw that this, this, desire to be famous, this desire to, to get the applause, this desire to be somebody was just exhausting. And it was never enough. It was never enough. Now, I had a teacher once say to me, Pass the sound of my students when I was teaching music. Do you want to be a musician or do you want to be a celebrity? It's not the same thing. If your goal in life is to be a celebrity, God help you. You might get it, you might not. It probably isn't what you think it's going to be. But if you want to be a musician, your mind is on the music because you love it. You do music for the love of music. Not make headlines. The world gives you applause. That's fine. That's their business. But you and I, if we work, According to our Swadharma, particular uh, mission, vocation, calling in life, all we get is the work. And it may not be successful. But we work and let go of our attachment to the fruits, the outcome. Any thoughts on this? So here is a spiritual, deeper understanding of sannyasa and jnana. All right, next verse. Yajam dosha vaditye ke karma pravur mahishana yakya dana tapak karma natyajam iti chapare all actions should be abandoned as evil, declare some philosopher, while others declare that acts of sacrifice, gift and austerity should not be relinquished. So there are those who come from philosophical schools 
that essentially say that our problem is karma. And what we need to do is stop acting so that we can stop producing karma. And then finally, when you get to a point where you have no karma, then you don't have to keep coming back and experiencing the fruits of your karma. Others say, no, what you need to do is do your duty. You are plopped into this world, born in a certain place, certain family, certain status. You decide what you want to do with your life. You may have gotten married, you may not. But whatever it is, you do it as your Swadharma, your duty. Enjoy it. Do what you love if you can. If not, learn to love what you do. So, you will not gain freedom. He's going to say in the next verse. We'll let, let him do it. So, he's talked about these two different approaches philosophically. Let's see what he says. Next verse. Oh. Nishayam Shurumi Tatra Yage Bharata Sattama Yago Hi Purusha Yagra Trividha Samprakitati. Hear from me the conclusion or the final truth about this abandonment, O best of the Bharatas. Abandonment, verily, O best of men, has been declared to be of three kinds. So he's going to give us this understanding. Now, let me, let me summarize in advance what we want to know. You can't ever be free from action at the level of the body. The dharma, remember the definition, the nature of a thing without which it would not be the thing that it is. The dharma of the body is karma. Karma just means action. All actions produce reactions. Escape at the level of the body. You know what you call a body that has no karma? A corpse. So one is not free by attempting to refrain from action. And I've actually had a, a student who lived with his grandmother, didn't want to have a job, didn't get involved with anybody, didn't want to have money, let his grandmother support him. And his idea was, I just don't want to have karma. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Always oh, act. But there are intelligent ways to act, which is what Krishna is going to talk about. So we're looking at this in three ways. Let's see what he says about it. Again, he's probably going to use the same lens that we've been using. Thomas Rajas and so on. Going on. Yakya dana Acts of service, charity, and austerity should not be abandoned, but should be performed. Worship, charity, and also austerity are the purifiers of even the wise. So these three, austerity, tapas, charity, dana, what was the other one that he said? Worship, the yajna. Yajna. Yajna means sacrifice more than worship. So we had a whole discussion of this back in the fourth and the fifth chapter. 
how to make everything in life a sacred action. I'm not going to do the whole teaching on it because we had a whole chapter on it. But the idea here is you've got a new employer. You don't work for Facebook, you work for God. Who's your partner? The partner is the Lord. When you're washing dishes, no, wait a minute, you're watching dishes. You make every action in your life sacred. Then, when it comes to our work, one of the definitions of Deva, which means of God, is the presiding principle over any field of human activity. So, for example, Sophia, what do you do for a living? Consulting. What do you consult on? CFO matters, financial matters. Financial matters. So, you have as the presiding principle wisdom and intelligence and good practice in the area of finance. I assume you've gone to school to learn about it been in the um, industry long enough that you have some understanding. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. So what you do is sacrifice, bring that knowledge, bring that wisdom of that presiding principle of human endeavor. Serve good financial practice. Now, what was the movie uh, that they did about the, the crash in 2008? The Big Short? The Big Short, yes. See, now those people did not serve the financial God well. That's the subtler understanding. Yeah. And whatever your field of, of uh, Endeavor is in life. So this is sacrifice. Also, it can mean worship. Worship is a really, really useful preparatory practice. So we'll use one of the Christian analogies. Um, in Christian mysticism, uh, many writers use the story of Jesus going to the home of Martha and Mary. Remember this one, Sophie? Yeah. So, what it is, Jesus comes, he's sitting there in a living room, small tomb God, and Mary's sitting at his feet. She's just in Samaria, she's totally missing. Martha is in her sister's in the kitchen. She's making food for everybody. So I always imagine her with lots of flour all over her or something. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. She comes out and says, Jesus, tell Mary to come into the kitchen and help. We've got a house full of people. He really says this. Martha, Martha. <laughs> he said it twice. Not Marsha, Marsha, but Martha, Martha. You are concerned over what you don't need to be concerned about. Mary has the better part. And this has been traditionally interpreted as what we call the active life versus the contemplative life. Or we would say in our tradition, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and then meditation. So it's a value to worship. God, does you understand that? 
or as you don't understand the heart. It's purifies the head and the heart. It's a value to do selfless service because we exhaust Vasana without it growing new stuff. All these rituals have a value, but they are essentially preparatory. When the mind is then still in the mind, then it's fit to engage into self inquiry. So it's not an either or, it's first then. Does everybody understand that? A lot of the people they'll read the highest and write the books and they'll say, oh, don't do all those practices, they're not necessary. Well, but if your mind's a mess, yeah, they're necessary. I won't be subtle about it. So there was austerity, there was worship, there was gift giving. We spent quite a bit of time in the last chapter talking about developing a spirit generosity in your life to free us from survival fear free from the fear of financial insecurity that's the major benefit and in india it is a duty to support the holy men and women so that this would be Was there another one besides tapas, dana, and, and yanya? Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? These are sattvic practices. Next one. I have a question. Please. With regards to like preparatory and, and your mind being a mess. Maybe this is a discussion for later, but my friends and I have often talked about communities that are marginalized. For example, the queer community, LGBT community, almost everything about the movement is based on personal identity. It's about the material self mm -hmm. and the ego. But it is so liberating, at least in the material world, for these movements to exist based on those identities, based on that ego. And it seems that there's this double-edged sword that one, without that ego-driven movement, people can't be at this basic level of secure and happy. But then it's also tying them to their ego in such a severe way. You, you hit a very important point. Ram Das used to say, you've got to be somebody before you're nobody. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung said, only a healthy ego can die. So if we're afflicted with low self-esteem, fear of being oppressed by a society, unresolved angers and resentments, and we don't know what to do with them. Absolutely. We need to develop a healthy self-esteem, a dignity, is different than the problem. We talk about like gay pride and stuff like that, but a better word I like is dignity. Uh, Maya Angelou came from a horrible upbringing, but I have never seen a woman with greater dignity. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Don't know who Maya Angelou was? Mm -hmm. This is something that was internally derived. Now, once you've resolved a lot of those reactivities, those uh, societal and family of origin issues, yoga then takes us to the next place. How much of that work do we need to do? Depends. Now, in this day and age, for many people who are involved 
We used to call it gay liberation. I don't know what you call a movement today. Does it have a name? No, I don't know anymore. Yeah. But anyway, the vast majority of them have no desire to go on and do yoga. And, and that's kind of the origin of this conversation I've been having with my friends, is that in the queer community, there are so many people that need to come to yoga, but are so attached to their identity now that I don't think that there's even a, an ability to start talking about it. Well, I, I'll push back on that. Go ahead. That's true. <laughs> But they're not in any different position than heteronormative people who are caught up in my thought. There is one thing that goes around now that I'm not sure is healthy in the end. And it's when people have become very aware of micro aggressions. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do is get you to change your behavior so that they feel safe. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. My experience is that's a completely losing battle a slight change on that is consciousness raising. When you say to someone, what you said was hurtful to people in this community, and this is why. Let me see if I can give you an example. So I have a dear friend, and he's um, Native American. His, his family's from Oaxaca. He's 100% Oaxaca uh, Mayan, what he is. Uh, his spiritual practically is Mexica, though it's an Aztec practice. So in passing, in conversation, I said, oh, next time you do a ceremony, do a rain dance. I did not know but that's a stereotypic phrase that white people use superimposing on indigenous peoples. It's uh, demeaning and insulting. Now, he didn't say, you know, read my bees, or blah, 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 how dare you? No, he explained to me about this. And once I saw it, I said, I'm so sorry. I'll never use that expression again. That's consciousness raising. Did that make sense? Yes. So I prefer that rather than getting angry at everybody because they have microaggressions. You can certainly bring unconscious behavior to people's awareness. But in the end, you will not have peace by trying to get other people to change. It will happen. It will happen. Any thoughts on this? No, I just I had a question about the uh, Mary and Martha. What you it's what you were saying that we have to be Martha until we, our mind is subtle enough to be Mary. Yes. Yes. It's not either or, it's first then. And how much Martha you need to do, that depends on how close your mind is. It, it, at some point, you will be drawn to a meditative life. Calls you. Okay, did we finish this first? Yeah. Next one. <laughs>
Um, sir, so I have a question on the meditative life and being drawn in school. Can you be drawn into the meditative life while still, you know, kind of like a job and everything else going on? Absolutely. For those who are really serious about self realization, there may come a time in your life when everything falls away. And you have usually two, two and a half years. And you do nothing but focus on yourself. That's certainly what happened in my life. It's certainly what happened with Swamiji when he finally, you know, did all his worldly stuff. He was in his 30s when he finally took some rest. And then when he met Swami Kapovana, a life of tremendous simplicity, austerity, just focusing on nothing. Now, in our scriptures, the authors of the Vedas, the most sacred scriptures in Hinduism, are called the Rishis. All of them were household. Whether or not they uh, were corporate executives, I don't know. <laughs> kind of doubt it. I bet they just owned lots of cows. But they did have families. Uh, Jim Shweta has a question. Yes, please go ahead, Shweta. Well, uh, it's it's from a couple of minutes ago, but I had not been able to unmute myself at that point. May I? We had ask? some bombers. That's why we we had everybody mute. Right, right, sure. May I ask from a few minutes ago? Please go ahead. Well, it was about the uh, story of, of uh, Martha and Mary that you were telling us about. Yes. So. Uh, this is something that uh, I often feel confused about, like uh, uh, how, how, how do, I don't know fully how to think about it. Like uh, there is the story of Martha and Mary uh, that we discussed, for instance. On the other hand, there are stories of, uh, you know, like the King Janaka, who was supposed to be uh, a, a man of full knowledge, but he was also a king. So he was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, clearly, or even even uh, uh, Ram, Lord Ram, for instance, right, who was a king, and clearly they would have been executing a lot of responsibilities and so on and so forth. So, uh, could you say a little more about that? Yes. Now these are remarkable people. Janaka's entire sadhana took uh, a muhurta, forty-eight minutes. Mm -hmm. Just like Ramana Maharshi, his took a half an hour. Uh, Ram, it's hard to say because he's a mythical being in some ways. Um, but in Yoga Vasishta, which is the story of the enlightenment of Lord of Ram, you know, he goes through a period of intense renunciation beforehand. Now, let me share with you what Yoga Vasishta says about it. We come to this gradually. It says at the beginning, take two quarters of your mind and uh, let it engage itself in uh, worldly enjoyments. Take one quarter of your mind in service, one quarter of your mind in devotion to the Guru. And after a while, one quarter of your mind in worldly pursuits. Uh, I think it's two quarters of your mind and no, one quarter of your mind and service, study of scriptures, service of the guru. And it, it goes on, meaning this can be a gradual process. As the mind gets more and more subtle, things of the world, this is the tyagaha, will just fall away. Will just but, fall away. Don't worry about it. But the question. It. Uh, no, I'm not worrying as such, just trying to understand. Like the question that arises in my mind is, 
how does one distinguish between activities of the world and uh, service, for instance? So as a concrete example, uh, so I'm, I'm a, a teacher, right? Now, yes. I feel at on the one hand, I feel that this material that I'm teaching is limited. I do think that there are higher truths, you know, that uh, that have better answers than than the things that I teach. On the other hand, when I look at the students, I feel that, you know, they really need this. So I don't really understand properly, you know, is is my time better spent in, uh, like you were saying, you know, spend more time on sadhana? You will know. Right now, this is where you are. Right now, you're a teacher. So focus on serving your students. It's not about being able to, you know, go from assistant professor to full professor, about getting tenure and schmenure and all that kind of business. You know, so many people in academia, my father was a professor. He used to say, do you know why academic politics are so vicious? Because the stakes are so low. <laughs> but you know, you have colleagues who are all into the politics of academia, who's chairman of the department and all that sort of business. Yeah, no, and, that that doesn't bother me at all. But yeah, so you serve the students, you serve the students. And if, if this is the subject that you're given to teach, this is your role right now. Now, the time may come when you have a yearning to leave it. And believe me, if it's your time to spend time in contemplation, the Lord will clear everything out. When I went into the ashram in the hate, I gave away everything I owned. I had nothing. Everything was provided. Everything was provided. And it will be if that's what's given you to do. But let it happen. Okay, then. Okay. Thanks, Jim. But trust it. If you have these desires, if fear says, I can't give up my job, I can't give up my job, what am I going to do about my retirement, stuff like that. You know, this is where we need to be sannyasis. You're married. This is a conversation to have with your husband. So, for example, when young people would want to join the Brahmachari training course in Mumbai, the Chinmaya Mission, especially the boys, Swamiji would make sure that there was another son to take care of the parents. A little bit traditional back in, in those days. But that's a primary responsibility. You don't abandon your duties to go after God. Um, Swami Tapovana, for many, many years, ran the family business after his father died. Finally, when his younger brother finished college, as a practicing attorney, he felt, now I can leave and go up to the Himalayas and take some vows. You know, if it's given you to do that. But I always say we're not healed so much by what we turn from as by what we turn to. Love God. Spend time in prayer, in meditation. Practice. What do we practice? Not just meditation. Do that. But practice. Vairagya. The desire, meaning we don't achieve it overnight, to give up all attachments to enjoyments gained through the senses and 
that desire to give up all identification within the form of self. And that you can practice whether you're teaching school or not. Yes, I useful? understand. Yes, very useful. Thank you, Jim. All right. I don't think we have time to, to, to do another verse at this point. So any other questions before we, we sign off tonight? We'll let our BART people get out in time to catch the train. Om Purnamada Purnamitam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Yogamaha Hari Om Om Tatsaka Now, when it comes to class deportment, I would appreciate it if you didn't get up and go get water and 